Hello, this is Madam Coffin, and I'd like to welcome you to my YouTube channel, Madam Coffin's Musings. Here, we would discuss all things that go bump in the night, with topics ranging from movies, television, music, and literature. If you like my video, please hit the subscribe button to be notified of my latest musings, or please leave a comment below. Now let's begin. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths, in particular Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother Franklin. It is all the more tragic in that they were young, but had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected, nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is considered to be one of the greatest and yet most controversial horror films of all time. Critic Leonard Wolf praised Toby Hooper's film as an exquisite work of art. Hell, even a print of the film has actually been enshrined in the permanent collection at New York's Museum of Modern Art. There have been comparisons that the film is a modern day Greek tragedy known in the lack of violence. It laid the foundations for many other classic horror movies to come. Films such as John Carpenter's Halloween, Evil Dead, The Blair Witch Project, and a slew of others were inspired by the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Iconic directors such as Wes Craven crafted his 1977's The Hills Have Eyes as an homage to Cooper's Chainsaw. Even in the world of science fiction, Cooper's masterpiece inspired a creative spark. Scott has been cited stating that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre even gave him the original idea for his blockbuster Alien. Directors of recent years have been smitten by the cinematography and storyline of Hooper's gritty realm of natural horror and aim to emulate the raw feel of the film. It stars Marilyn Burns, Paul A. Pratan, Edwin Neal, Jim Sido, William Dale, Alan Danzinger, Terry McNeen, John Dugan, and Gunnar Hansen as the now widely known character Leatherface. How did the Texas Chainsaw Massacre propel itself from humble beginnings to the legend that it is today? Simple. A marketing employee. The beginning narration, read in serious tone by the amazing John Larroquette, helped sell the idea that there really were a crazy family of cannibals living in Texas somewhere. Oh, it has been rumored that Larroquette's payment for the narration was just one marijuana joint. A fun tidbat, my fiends. Humans have a morbid curiosity of the strange and unusual. We crane our necks to see the victim of an accident because we are curious. How did it happen? What the hell happened? Is that person alright? I'm glad it wasn't me. Cooper relied on that curiosity and used that based on true events ploy to bring people to the theater seats. And like cattle, we follow him to the slaughterhouse. But Hooper had a message to convey. He wanted to express his thoughts about being lied to by the government about what was going on in the world at that time. You have to remember that in the early 70s, the world had endured the Watergate scandal, the 1973 oil crisis, and let's not forget the real massacres and atrocities in the Vietnam War. The rose-tinted glasses that everyone can get along have been shattered. 
people were ugly towards each other. It did not care about the repercussions, and Hooper was fed up with it all. He wanted to point out to everyone that man was the real monster here, just wearing a different face. So he embodied that monster into his film. So the plot is largely fictional, thank goodness, but with the marketing and word of mouth, many believe that Texas Chainsaw Massacre really happened. It kinda sorta did. All horror fans know that one of the monsters that Hooper had in mind largely influenced the creation of Leatherface and his family. That monster was the mass grave robber slash murderer Ed Gein. In this case, mostly for his interior decorating skills and his mental prowess. Gein's repulsive acts, still to this day, are a blueprint for numerous horror movies. The idea of our killer's choice of weapon came to Hooper's mind while he struggled to survive the joy of Christmas shopping. Surrounded by a horde of holiday shoppers in a hardware store, Hooper spotted a line of chainsaws on display and thought that would clear a crowd. Who hasn't thought of that due to people not respecting your personal space, especially in these last few months that we've been living in? So Hooper had his idea. He cast a bunch of local Texan actors to play the roles, but had to keep a tight budget. With budget concerns and high-cost rental equipment, shooting Texas Chainsaw was not for the weak. Time is money. The cast and crew working grueling seven days a week up to 16-hour workdays. To add a little more misery to the process, shooting began in the middle of July in the sweltering Texan heat. The actors also had to deal with a less than luxurious set as well. To add to the charm of the homestead, all the set pieces included actual carcasses, animal bones, and rotten meat. The house did not have air conditioning, and the lights heat the house up even more. Pushed to a breaking point, the actors were making impromptu decisions that today would be a lawsuit in the making. During the torturous dinner scene, Sally was supposed to have her finger cut by Leatherface so the family's patriarch, played by then 18-year-old John Duggan, could drink her blood. The prop knife they used, which contained a tube of fake blood that Hanson was to squeeze onto Burns' finger, malfunction. They tried many takes, and finally, Hanson grew so impatient that he sliced her finger for real before exposing her to Duggan's saliva. Another poor judgment you can see is when Leatherface's leg actually gets cut by the chainsaw. All that Hansen had put in place to protect him was a thin sheet of metal. Needless to say, that was shot in one take. Another example is when Jim Sido, who played another one of the maniacs, later recall how during a scene where his character was to beat Sally, Dance again became more real than a slasher film should allow. He had trouble with the depiction of violence and couldn't get himself to a place where he could simulate the vicious beating. But as Hooper and others in the cast and crew, including Burns herself, prodded him to actually strike her, screaming things like hit her, hit her harder, hit her some more. Seidel eventually settled into the brutality. Seidel recalled, Finally, I got with it and started having fun doing it and started really slugging her, and we kept that up. We did eight shots, and then they finally say, That's a take. She just fainted dead away. The poor girl was beating up pretty badly. It's a wonder that no one snapped working in these conditions, but alas... Filming was wrapped and Hooper was really hopeful that the Motion Picture Association of America would give his complete, uncut project a PG rating due to his minimal amount of gore on the screen. 
I have no idea in what he was thinking. The association laugh at Hubert's efforts and slap an X rating on the film. Dismayed, Hooper scrapped several minutes from the film and resubmitted, which resulted in the MPAA lowering the rating to an R. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, premiering in Austin, Texas on October 1st, 1974, almost a year after filming concluded. It screened nationally in the United States as a Saturday afternoon matinee and its false marketing as a true story helped it attract a broad audience. Legend has it that on a certain evening in October 1974, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre would sneak preview at a theater in San Francisco where half the audience got sick and others pelted the screen, yell obscenities, and demanded their money back. Fist fights broke out in the lobby and the film became infamous. Of course, word got around about the impact the movie had on the audience, and the film eventually grossed more than $30 million in North America and $14.4 million in rentals, making it the 12th highest grossing film initially released in 1974. The movie has been followed by several other films to date, including sequels, prequels, and remakes. In 1982, shortly after the Texas Chainsaw Massacre established itself as a success on U.S. home video, Wizard Video released a mass-market video game adaptation for the Atari 2600. As one of the first horror-themed video games, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre caused controversy when it was first released due to its violent nature. It sold poorly as a result because many game stores refused to stock it. I wonder how much that game is worth now. Thank you for watching my video, and I hope to see you again soon. Remember, please hit the subscribe button to be notified of my latest music. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook if you crave more. Until then, Beast wishes.